And again, thank you all for providing this information. All right, great. Well, uh, it is 3 o'clock Eastern, and so with that being said, we'll go ahead and begin today's webinar. All right, so let's get started here. Again, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. The role of the juvenile prosecutor. My name is William Moore, and I'm with OJJD. Announcements to keep in mind. Uh, please note that this webinar is being recorded. Our webinar will be linked to the INTAC YouTube page. And please note that um, if you would like to access our YouTube page, the link on this slide is live, mm -hmm. where you can uh, view this webinar and other archived webinars from the past. For any transcript or supporting materials, you can contact the OJDP TTA Help Desk at the information on this slide. For those wishing to download a copy of important documents and resources related to today's webinar, including the bios of the presenters here today, you may do so by locating the handouts pod directly above the chat area. Here you will find the webinar PowerPoint and an FAQ for webinar participants that will likely address any technical related questions. Simply click on the name of the file and then click the download button. At the, during and at the end of today's webinar, you all will be able to ask your questions. Uh, to the presenters. You may do so by typing your question into the chat box. Please feel free to type your questions in the chat box there as they arise. Mm -hmm. For those participating in today's webinar as a group, please take a minute to help us count. If you're viewing by yourself or alone, there's no need to type anything at this time. However, if you're viewing with a group of individuals, meaning it's yourself and maybe one or two or three other individuals, please help us count. Go to the chat pod and type in the total number of additional people in the room with you today. Again, if you're viewing alone, there's no need to type anything at this time. But if you're viewing with others, please type in the total number of additional people in the room with you today. Please note that following today's webinar, uh, attendees will receive a certificate of attendance. Uh, the individual attendee certificate is that attendees, uh, excuse me, the process is that attendees signed in will receive an automated feedback email uh, with the certificate of attendance in it. Now, attendees that are joining as a part of a group, please note that you should download the group validation form in the handouts pod, complete it, and send it to OJJDP TTA at USDOJ.gov if you would like the other individuals in the group with you to receive a certificate. Again, that's only for folks who are dialed in as a group with other people. Uh, if you'd like the other people to receive a certificate, you can complete that form and we can get that on over to you. All right, uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our moderator, Susan Roderick, for today's presentation. Susan, take it away. Thank you, William. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Susan Broderick. I am a senior attorney with the National District Attorneys Association, currently working on a grant for um, juvenile prosecutors across the country. It's a grant um, that we have received from the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, and it's an absolute honor to be here today um, to talk to you about the role of the juvenile prosecutor. So as you see on this slide, um, this has the learning object objectives listed, um, and you can read those for yourself. Um, the, we're going to go over ethics, guiding principles, dispositional options, the expanding role of the prosecutor, and the importance of information sharing. Um, that's me. <laughs> and um, as um, William told you, the um, bios are in the handouts. Um, all I'll let you know is that I have been a prosecutor um, or working with prosecutors my entire professional career, and I started as a prosecutor in the Manhattan DA's office back in 1989. 
So um, I don't want to waste any more time on my bio, but um, our presenter today is somebody who is um, truly one of the leaders in um, among juvenile prosecutors across the country. And Anthony and I have been working together for um, many years and have worked together on the um, presentation that you're about to see. One of the things I would note is that we're doing this presentation, we sort of pivoted during COVID because we were set to do a, an in-person regional training. And then with you know the cancellations and everything happened, that was happening, we realized as prosecutors, well, you know what, we're problem solvers. So how are we gonna pivot in this situation? And we decided to let's bring it to as many people as we can through a webinar. So here we are. Um, one of the things I will note is that there's a lot of material in um, what we've prepared. And actually this, um, when we do this in person, it's much longer than an hour, but we are going to try to hit all the highlights of this today. Um, we encourage you to ask questions. We also realize that a really um, a high number of people have registered for this today, so we're not sure we're going to be able to respond to every question individually. If we don't get to, get to your question, um, we will be responding to you after um, this webinar. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to our presenter, Anthony Piero, and we will start the role of the juvenile prosecutor. Susan, thank you. I, I appreciate that. and it's. And like you said, it's just an honor to be here, uh, to be speaking to all of you across the country. And, you know, I just want to start with how important this, this role is. And, you know, it's, it's something that at times I think is overlooked. Uh, juvenile prosecutors, what does that mean? If you ask people in your, possibly even in your own office, what does that mean? They might give you a, a crazy answer, right? Like, uh, I don't know, you do bicycle thefts, right? Or you're, uh, chewing gum in class. And, and things like that. And those are things that, that I hear all the time. And, and I want to start with when we talk about the role of the juvenile prosecutor, what your job is, uh, it's amazingly important. It's incredibly serious. Uh, you have this phenomenal opportunity to change lives. And we're going to talk about that a lot today. And uh, I just, I really want to thank you for doing it, for being involved in, in juvenile justice, for, for committing whatever portion of your career you are in. And I saw Initially, a lot, of the, a lot of the answers were that you had moderate to extensive experience. Uh, that's incredible. It's incredible that people are committing to this because that's what it's going to take uh, to do this job. It, this is a hard job. This is not easy. And anybody who tells you otherwise has never done it or has never done it properly. And, and I just, again, want to take the, take the time to thank you for uh, being on the webinar, committing your career, uh, this portion of your career to juvenile justice. And, uh, and with that, I want to start with the history. We, we don't get anywhere if we don't understand our history. Uh, juvenile justice also has a history. It began, uh, I'm terrible at math, but I think that's 121 years. I could be wrong about that, um, in Chicago. And when that court was created, it, it, of course, at the time, it, everything was criminal court. And young people were being brought into the criminal courts. And, uh, and Chicago had this phenomenal idea of how about we try something different? How about we look at juveniles in a little bit of a different way? Uh, and it's amazing when you, when you go through the history and you, and you look at how the courts began. It's a lot of what we're talking about today in our juvenile courts. It's a lot about uh, the same type of issues continue uh, to come up. And I think that's important to, as prosecutors for us to realize because there is so much history behind us. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about state-specific stuff as well in a little bit, but it's just important to understand when the court began what it was about. Uh, they really wanted to make it different. They wanted specialists to be involved. They, they wanted to really take a look at what was going on in the life of the juvenile in a very informal, in a very private, uh, in a very protective way, actually. Uh, prosecutors' roles were not, uh, you were not involved in certainly in the way that we are now. Uh, the courts did a lot of this on their own, and it was so successful uh, that almost every state in the country by the 1920s had adopted some version of juvenile court. And of course, today, every, every state in the country has some form of juvenile court jurisdiction. It's important for you to also look at your state's history on juvenile justice. Uh, there is so much good information for you to have in your uh, legislative history. Uh, juvenile court has changed a lot over the years. Uh, and it's really important to understand where your state was, what it did, where it went, the purposes, the legislative purposes behind that reform, 
I think there's a lot there when you look internally at your state as to what you're then doing as a juvenile court prosecutor today. So, so please take the time to do that. I, when I do a state uh, presentation, I go through New Jersey's specific legislative history, why we changed our statutes, when we changed it, uh, what was happening in our, in our communities at the time that it was changed, the purpose behind them, uh, and I think that's really important. Of course, as you know, uh, the system really didn't work uh, the way that the original intenders designed. It actually uh, became quite different. Uh, juveniles were mistreated. It became worse than the adult system. There were racial inequities, uh, and there was no procedural regularities at all. And in Ray Galt, as you know, the nation uh, a few years ago celebrated the 50 years of in Ray Galt, and, and I think it's important to highlight what happened in that case just briefly because uh, Jerry Galt was 15 years old. He was accused of making an obscene phone call to a neighbor. Uh, he was on probation at the time of his arrest, so he was arrested and brought to the detention center uh, immediately. His parents were actually not notified. They never saw a petition uh, for two months after the time that he was arrested. When they came home from work, they had no idea where he was. They had to find him uh, because nobody notified his parents that he was arrested. He was 15, as I said at the time, uh, without any procedural protections, without any attorney, uh, like I said, without his parents even knowing what the charges were, he was sentenced to six years uh, in juvenile detention. And, and if we talked about that around the country today, you, you would just be amazed. And, and unfortunately, that's where the system went. It became so different uh, than what the original purpose of the juvenile justice system was uh, that there were significant changes. And the changes continued. And through the 80s and 90s, uh, it really became a, a tough-on-crime approach. I started in juvenile court in 1999, uh, just by way of background. And when I started, we were talking a lot about uh, juvenile waiver, about transfer, about tough-on-crime legislation, about how do we, how do we make waiver automatic? Uh, what, what is the prosecutor or the judiciary's role in waiver? And that's because juvenile delinquency rates were climbing. People were concerned about what that was going to look like. Uh, people were concerned about juvenile crime, as they are today, and I think it's important uh, to, to recognize that. Uh, and I think when you have that history and you understand that we have been through a number of different iterations of our juvenile court, and I think what the great thing about being a juvenile prosecutor today is, is that we have that at our disposal. We've read in Ray Galt. We've read Kent versus the United States. We've read Fair versus Michael C. We understand the procedural background that has to exist in this court. We understand how important that is. We also understand uh, the newer decisions, the Roper decisions, Miller, Graham. Uh, we understand adolescent brain development. We understand trauma. Uh, and, and it's because of our history that we are, I think, where we are. And the great thing about uh, today and the opportunity that we have today is that the numbers are dramatically smaller than they ever have been. Uh, we have the opportunity, and you know, we always talk in juvenile court about individualized. It has to be individualized. It has to matter to that person that's standing before the court. And because the numbers are smaller, because we're in that, that really in another change, I, I think a significant change in juvenile court, what it is, what we want it to be, uh, that we're actually able to do this and be very deliberate about how we handle juvenile offenders. So I think it's an exciting time to be part of the juvenile justice system. I think it's a, uh, uh, just a real exciting time. In addition, because of the support we have from the Department of Justice, uh, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, as well as the National District Attorneys Association. This is new. Uh, this support, we, we, it, we need to be trained as prosecutors. And I think when prosecutors start in any office, Right? We, we normally get evidence training. We normally understand how to introduce a piece of evidence. We understand how to appear in court, what we're supposed to say. Uh, you know, most of us do. Uh, what we're supposed to say, how we're supposed to handle ourselves. It's the juvenile piece. And it's very interesting because when we talk about juvenile trainings throughout the country, we very rarely talk about the admission of evidence. We very rarely talk about expert testimony. We are, because that's available. That's available to prosecutors. And through the support of the NDAA, uh, OJJDP, and obviously through them, the Department of Justice, we have gotten to a point where we are trying to enhance uh, the current knowledge base 
of juvenile court prosecutors, what that means to be a juvenile court prosecutor. It is different. Anybody who's been in this court for uh, 15 minutes understands how different it is. When I went from criminal court to juvenile court, uh, I felt like I walked into a completely different everything, universe, and I did. And it didn't take me very long to realize uh, that I did. So I know that many of you have a lot of experience, so I, I do want you to ask questions throughout the course of the presentation. Uh, if there is anything that I am not answering that you really want me to dive deeper in, I'm happy to do it. Uh, as Susan said, this is a several hour presentation that we're going to do in an hour. So some of the answers may come after the presentation, but I do want to answer them uh, because I think it's important that, especially those of you with extensive experience, that we dive deep enough uh, so that this is helpful to you. Um, so we're going to go through where we are. We went through the history, and we talk now about stakeholders. Because those original courts were focused, offender focused. They were focused on the young person that appeared before the court. They were focused on that person's family history, that, that person's uh, issues and what was going on in the life of that young person. And that's great, and we still do that. But there are other stakeholders in the juvenile justice system. Uh, victims are incredibly important to our system. We have to talk about victims. Uh, it, it's funny because I probably have prosecuted uh, 30, 40,000 cases in my career, and, and we all have. And I have never, you know, gone to sit with a victim and discuss the, the facts of the case. And, and I'll give you a, a personal story. Uh, I was, I parked my car on the street somewhere. Uh, this is going back 20, 25 years. And I get back, and everything in the car is stolen. Everything, everything in my car had been stolen. The last thing I thought, was I wonder how old the person was that, that took all my stuff. And yet, we sometimes treat victims as if that matters, and it doesn't. Victims don't care, and, and I say that, and I'm going to correct myself in a, in a minute. Victims don't come into our system caring that the person was 17, 15, or, or, or 22. But victims do care when you spend the time with them that people are kids and that there is brain development differences, that there are young people in our society that do silly things that are not uh, as serious as those things that adults do, and they do things that are. But victims understand that, but it should never be done in a way where they're not involved. And it's amazing to me. I I've handled uh, every type of case, obviously, and, uh, you know, victims to me at times are some, some of the most sensitive, caring individuals that I have spoken to, they care about young people, they care about what, what is going on in that person's life, they want to be part of the solution, they, they, want to, uh, they want to help, but they just want to know. They want to be part of it, and they should be. And it's our job to do that. We represent the state, and as part of representing the state, the victim is, is there. And it's our role, and, and, and I take this very seriously because it's, it, it, somebody who has been victimized is not voluntarily part of this system. They have been forced into our system. They have been thrust into it. And especially the juvenile system, where most of our victims are also young people, they are thrown to us, and they have no idea who we are. They have no idea what the system is. Uh, and it's important for us to remember that, especially in a system that is focused on rehabilitation, because you might be the only person in that courtroom who says the word victim. You might be the only person in the entire system that talks to them as if they have been wronged in some way, and it's important we do it. They are entitled to restitution. They should provide statements. You should encourage them to speak to the court and to, uh, and, and to impress upon the court what happened. And, and I say as part of my arguments all the time, I cannot speak on behalf of the victim as, el as, as elegantly and eloquently as they can because they have experienced whatever it is we're talking about. I can do the aggravating factors. I can do mitigating factors. I can talk about the impact of the offense on the community, but the victim should speak for themselves. And if they want to, they should. And they should be afforded the opportunity to come into court and express themselves. Uh, and, you know, this isn't just court. We go to a lot of meetings. We, we talk about juvenile system reform. We talk about how to do things better. We're always looking to improve, and I love that about the juvenile justice system. We never sit on our hands and say, good enough. We are always looking to do better because we expect better of ourselves, and we owe it to the young people uh, that are before the courts to do better, always. The same thing goes for victims. 
We always need to be better. And when we do that, I have found victims to be unbelievably compassionate and willing to work with you uh, and work with the case. Uh, the times that victims are not happy is when you divert a case without telling them, decide not to prosecute something without telling them, or decide to plead a case uh, without involving them and telling them. So again, I encourage you as really the, the, the one person whose obligation is, is to victims to make sure that they're part uh, of your system, and that includes meetings as well. I want to talk about communities because I think communities get lost as well. And it's, it's amazing to me that, that the community would get lost sometimes because it's obvious, right? But the community wants to feel safe. The community wants to be protected. Uh, and us as state actors, we have an obligation to that community. That's, our, that's part of our charge is to make sure that our community is safe. And we're going to talk about this when we talk about offenders in a moment. But the community is owed that. That's, that's the obligation of all of us is to create safe communities. I, I laugh about this all the time. You want to go, you want to go for a walk. You, you want to do the things that communities do, uh, and we, we owe it to that place to, to make sure we're driving that message home. It, it's, again, it's one of the most overlooked things in our system is talking about the harm that's done to our communities, making sure that community service uh, is ordered as part of disposition. Uh, communities love that. And, and there are some cases where you can order community service, obviously, or where it's going to look different than in other cases. But, but make sure that your community is heard as a group, as a group, because we want to validate the fact that every time a crime is committed in a community, that there is some harm. There is harm being done to that community. Uh, and it's important that we highlight it, again, as, as people that represent uh, the state and, therefore, the community. I mentioned offenders because we also have an obligation to offenders. It is juvenile justice. And our obligation is to recognize the special nature of juveniles as offenders. Our obligation is to make sure that we are standing behind uh, that rehabilitative goal, making sure that we're doing our best to create a system that legitimizes families, that legitimizes environmental and family issues that young people may be dealing with, that recognizes emotionally and cognitively the limitations that some young people have. And we, what's interesting to me about this is, and this is how I always tie this together when I'm in court, is that the offenders themselves have an obligation to the victim, the community, and to themselves. I hear all the time, I go to meetings, and I'll hear about technical violations of probation and how young people aren't doing what they're supposed to do, and, and that's just them telling the judge. Don't worry about it, judge. I'm not going to do it. Or, or that judges may impose sentences on violations of probation because the judge is offended. And I, I always argue the opposite. It's the community and, therefore, the offender themselves that owes it to themselves. Not to the judge. You don't owe anything to the judge. You don't owe anything to me as the prosecutor. I'm not, uh, I'm not going to be offended in a personal way if a young person is struggling completing the terms or conditions. Uh, of their probation. It's the community. It's them. Because that's how we're building strong young people. That's how we're putting them out in a, in a, that's exactly how we're pushing them out into our system better, rehabilitated, uh, more able to understand the stressors uh, of life that they're going to face, obviously, and, and helping them to develop, to grow, to do all the things that rehabilitation means. And, and, and that's a whole other webinar on what that actually means. But that's our, uh, that's our obligation. And as we talk about the court action has lifetime impact, it's extremely important uh, to make sure that we understand that whatever we do is going to have strong impact. You're also the prosecutor. And we have to have justice in our system. We have to have fairness in our system. We have to make sure, as prosecutors, that this is happening. Uh, it's our obligation. We cannot have justice by geography. We cannot have justice for other reasons. Uh, we have to make sure that we are uh, understanding and not only disproportionate minority contact, but we now obviously are also calling it racial and ethnic disparities. We need to understand that. We need to understand and work with our communities to do something about that, to embrace that, to make sure that we're comfortable using the data and having those important and critical discussions uh, in your system. We need to make sure that our programs, that we're asking these young people, are actually producing results. We as prosecutors need to do that. We need to make sure that we're not sending young people to places where results are poor, 
where they're not working, where uh, unfortunately it's just it's re producing negative results versus the positive ones. And a lot of that is through understanding and becoming more familiar with uh, not only adolescent brain development, but your local communities, your local practices, those programs, who the intended person is, target is, making sure that those people are the ones going to those programs, making sure that we're using the right dosage, so to speak, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, uh, and of course using uh, and making sure that there's fidelity behind these programs. This is really important to make sure that we're uh, standing up for a just and fair system uh, as we uh, as we approach juvenile justice. We are going to talk about ethics. Uh, I was invited to speak on ethics uh, in Pennsylvania probably a few years ago, and, and it was the interesting part was we talked about ethics, the role of the prosecutor, ethical dilemmas that face the prosecutor. And I think the group was, was astounded because what I said was, if you're doing your job right as a prosecutor, you are not facing as many ethical issues as you think you are or will. Because we have to, as a juvenile prosecutor, seek justice, fully and faithfully represent the interests of the state, making sure that the safety and welfare of the community, including the victim, is a primary concern. Yet we consider the special circumstances, interests, and needs of a juvenile to the extent that we can do so without compromising public safety that, and that, to me, is something that we should be striving for every day. Uh, and, my, and what I do, personally, I know that I ask why all the time. Why am I doing this? What's the purpose of me doing this? Uh, how, do, how am I getting there? Is this something that's, that's going to work? Uh, is this something that can be accomplished in the way that I think it can be accomplished? Uh, and I think what's really important here is to become familiar with the NDAA prosecution standards, uh, get, you know, read, read obviously those standards. Uh, the policy positions to me are, are critical for our understanding. Uh, and we all need to make sure that we're doing exactly what this slide says. That's how we become uh, better at our jobs. That's challenging ourselves to ask these questions uh, and making sure. And, you know, some of the ethical pieces are, and you've all experienced this, you have a juvenile a defense attorney who comes into court and they have never done a juvenile case before. Their expertise is in bankruptcy. And all of a sudden, that's what you're, that's what you're dealing with. And it's easy, right, to, to not recognize that, to not assist that, that attorney. Uh, and that, I think, is where oftentimes our interest, because we have a job, uh, of course, which is to, to be the prosecutor, but our obligation is also to the young person uh, and to the court. Can everybody still hear me? I know that I'm, I see some, okay. I want to talk about discretion. Our discretion is something that we, we need to use all the time. It's the heart of our prosecutorial function. It's what separates every case that comes before the court is us. When I began, I actually, in, in our court system, the prosecutor did not screen the juvenile cases that came before the court. Somebody else was doing it. And it was something that I immediately, immediately took over. Because that's part of your role in doing all the things that we talked about, is making sure that the right people are before the court. And I'm going to give an example. One of my first cases was a 10-year-old boy who was chasing a 9-year-old girl up a tree to give her a kiss. That's, that was my case. That's what was handed to me as a case. And I thought to myself, there's no way I just spent $200,000 to do this. There, there's no possible way that this is what I'm supposed to be doing in juvenile court. And it was something that, that stuck with me that we need to determine who gets charged, what cases should be diverted, because we have the legal expertise, the consistency, the accountability, uh, and we need to make sure that there are facts to support these allegations, that, that they are worthy of a charge. And I, I want you to ask yourself that all the time in the, in the utilization of your discretion. Is this something that we need court involvement? 
and I'm going to talk about diversion in, in a few slides, but is this something that I need the court involvement to do, or are there other ways to get something accomplished, something better accomplished? And I'm going to give a few examples in a minute, but it, it's really important that you not, and to the extent that your states allow it, that you not just show up into court after somebody else has screened your cases, after a, a police officer or a probation officer, because they don't have the same obligations as you do. They don't have the same responsibilities uh, as you do. And I think it's, it's without question amplified in juvenile court. Because in addition to your job as a prosecutor, you're also considering special circumstances of the juvenile to the extent possible. You're also taking into account uh, the, everything that we've talked about thus far. You're, you're looking at uh, the juvenile justice system, what its intentions are, what you can get out of it, what, what the point is behind it. And that is amplified in our courts. Uh, and it's really important that we were involved from the very beginning. And it's something that I stress in New Jersey all the time is that we are, we are going to be involved in screening every single case. I read personally every single case in, in, in my county where there is a charge uh, against a, a young person. And it, to me, it's important. It's important. I get to see what's happening around the county, but I also get to decide on a very consistent basis using the same criteria on every single case, which cases are coming before the court and which aren't. It also allows me to do a different job. I can identify what's needed in our community. I can identify the types of cases that, that are coming in. And I could really make a, a very concerted effort and a, and a specific effort to make sure that that uh, is happening. And I, and I think that tailors, goes right into our expanded role. The juvenile prosecutor will do so much more than your adult court prosecutor counterpoint. This is not meant at all as a negative. Uh, I think it's just really important that we, that we highlight it because you're not just doing prosecutor things. You are not just doing the same uh, traditional role. You are a researcher. You have to stay current on science and research. And, and, and to be honest, when I started this job, research was the last thing that I wanted to do. But you need to be aware of this, the current youth and adolescent development research. You need to be aware of what it says, how it's said, whether or not the research papers have the, are, are being used correctly in your courts. You have an obligation to your, to your court and to your state and county that you represent to only allow evidence before a court that actually is, is based in science or fact uh, and that actually is going to be helpful to the court. So how do you do that if you don't even know what the research says yourself? This is super time consuming. And I'll be honest, I spend a great deal of, of my time on, on reading uh, and trying to make sure that I am as up to date as possible. And that's on a global scale. You also need to become knowledgeable. Uh, on not only community-based alternatives generally, but your community-based alternatives. What, it, what exists in your community? What doesn't exist? Does it work? Um, I'm part of our Youth Services Commission, and part of my responsibilities is to, uh, we actually go around to all the programs that are funded in our county, and we monitor them, and we actually are looking at the results. We're taking into account what's working, how can we improve this program, is it targeting the right young people? Is it then successful? Uh, however you define that in your program. Um, the diversion programs that I create, I personally try to make sure that we're collecting data uh, and we're looking to see what, what, what works and what needs to be enhanced. And you also, again, need to become familiar uh, with the principles of effective intervention. That is a, a critical piece of this um, because it's really important for you to know what criminogenic needs are, whether or not they're being addressed and attacked by the programs that you are sending young people to, uh, and just what they are so that you could identify them when people come before the court, so that you can, again, tailor, because I think that's one of the perfect things of the juvenile court, you can then tailor a disposition that actually addresses those things so that you can reduce recidivism, which uh, at the end of the day is, is incredibly important uh, in our world, is to, is to create and make young people that get through the system better than when they came in and not do damage or harm uh, when they're appearing before our courts. You're also a community leader. You know, uh, I, I love this piece because nobody calls me back because I'm Anthony Piero. Nobody even knows who that is. They call me back because I'm an assistant prosecutor. They call me back because there's a title behind my name and they know that we as community leaders, as prosecutors, uh, can, can leverage that and can do a lot of different things. And that's not just uh, Prosecution, and it's not just law enforcement. It's 
crime prevention. It's creating a positive image for your office so that when your community does experience issues, that you are the first person that they go to, uh, that you are looking at promoting public safety beyond the courtroom. Uh, I do an entire presentation on leadership beyond the courtroom. What does that mean? What is it that we're supposed to be doing beyond the courtroom? How do we address crime and, 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 and get the solutions for crime? One of the ways, and I'll, I'll give a few examples, is I am involved in our school. We have a school justice partnership, of course, but uh, I personally went to every school district in our county, and I sat down with the superintendent, and I ended up getting invited to superintendent monthly meetings. And I have a, there's an agenda, I'm not there for the entire meeting, but it's an opportunity for the superintendents and administrators in every school district in my county to talk to me about issues and for me to talk to them. So if we're having a bullying issue in a school, I can address it. If we're having a sexting issue in a school or a, a photo issue in a school, I can address it. If we're having other issues we, in, our, in our community, we can address it. One of the other things that we created was a family crisis intervention program and we collaborated with our family crisis so that we can actually become involved earlier on in the process uh, when younger people were having issues that were not criminal but were family related because oftentimes that leads to delinquency and what we figured out was if we could get chaplains involved in that program that we had even more success if we could get religious leaders involved we were having even more success with our program so we partnered with religious organizations throughout our county so if there's an issue with a young person in the community, we can contact that religious leader and say, can you help? Can you do something? Can you engage this family? And those are just a few examples, and I'm happy to share more, obviously, that things that we can do that are not prosecutor-driven, not prosecutor-driven in that sense, but in the courtroom, uh, not just standing up arguing for dispositions, uh, but also doing stuff behind the scenes. Uh, and I think that's really important for us to do, especially now, especially now. We, we have an obligation to our communities. We have an obligation to our young people and the residents in those communities. And, uh, and this is a great time uh, to, to be involved in those community outreaches. Because that, you know, when you do these things, you become involved in ways that you never thought you would. You become a representative of your office in the community. You become the person doing presentations, public speeches, uh, and outreaching to address juvenile crime. And we have seen a, an enormous reduction in juvenile crime, which allows us to do this. And at the end of the day, we all know uh, that law enforcement efforts alone can't solve these issues. We need to make sure that we're partnering with our community so that we're listening as much as we're talking. And I think that's something that, uh, that we've tried to do here, and, and I hope that you're doing in your states uh, and in your communities. And again, I'm happy to, we're, we're limited to an hour today, but I'm happy to talk to anybody who has questions about how we've tried to do this because it's intentional here, and it should be intentional on your efforts as well. And you have to work with families. Uh, families love their, their kids, and families want their kids to succeed. And we need to make sure that we're bringing them into the fold. Uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, that I've become familiar with is, is a study that they're doing, and Susan and I talk about this all the time, but they're called influencers, people in that young person's life who can actually help you get them to comply with conditions while they're in the community get them to engage with services that you're trying to impose. Uh, and, and if we can find those people in that young person's life that they uh, respect, look up to, listen to, uh, this is a great way, just an absolutely great way uh, to, get, to get communities uh, working in the right direction. So when we decide to charge, this is obviously one of the most important decisions that a prosecutor will make. And it has to be done by an attorney. Um, I think that it's really important that an attorney and a prosecutor be the one who makes this determination. I've talked about this a little bit, but this is really important because nobody should go through the juvenile system because there isn't another system that can handle it. Uh, you know, and, and what I mean by that is if there's not probable cause to support a charge, then somebody shouldn't be charged. And I think it's incredibly important that we uh, remember that. that yeah, we want to help people. We obviously want to help. We're in the business of helping and rehabilitating and, uh, and also protecting. Uh, but at the same time, we can't do that. Uh, there are other systems. And I think that's part of your leadership outside of the courtroom is enhancing those systems. So um, our juvenile court is part of the family court. 
we have a separate uh, DHS system that we do have liaisons that appear in court. But if I need my division of youth services to become involved, I might need to use my authority to press that because it might be that the division is the better place for that issue than the criminal justice system and the juvenile justice system. So this charging function is incredibly important. Uh, obviously, when you determine these, uh, you're going to have state statutes that control, but we've, we've highlighted some factors that you should consider uh, and things that you, that you should not consider, obviously. And you want to look at all of these. It's, it's really important that every single case gets an individual <laughs> assessment, that it not just be charge-driven. We all know this. I couldn't figure out why robbery was the, on November 1st, robbery, I used to get robberies. It's, that's every case that came in was a robbery until I realized and had kids of my own that October 31st is Halloween, kids go trick-or-treating, and everybody in the community is stealing each other's candy. And people are going to the police and they want robbery charges. And it just took me a little bit, I'm slow, it took me a little bit to, to figure that out. And if, the, if everything was just charge-driven, then we would have a situation where all those robberies were coming through court versus actually me giving it an in individual assessment. So you want to make sure that you're consistent across the board. You want to make sure that, uh, that you have the ability uh, to do that, uh, and you want to create a system that does it. And, of course, you want to, you want to focus on dangerousness, threat, uh, because there are, unfortunately, young people in our community that commit very serious crimes. Uh, we do have young people that present an incredible threat to the community, uh, and the community knows that, uh, and I think it's important that we, that we do are aware of that in our charging function. In regard to adjudication, uh, the one thing that I'll say uh, in regard to plea agreements is make sure that whatever the young person is saying and what they are pleading guilty to is what you expect them to plead guilty to, what the victim expects to hear in court. We, we obviously do plea agreements all the time, uh, and I've unfortunately learned the hard way that what a young person says as their factual basis is exactly what they're going to be held accountable for later. And if you don't hold them accountable to what it is that you think they're pleading guilty to, uh, then later on, when they do violate the terms or do, or, or do something, uh, you're going to have no effort. I've also had victims that were very unsatisfied. Uh, and I think it's important that, that, because that's our role. The judge doesn't know what the communication with the victim was. The judge may not know what you're expecting somebody to take responsibility for. And responsibility is part of rehabilitation. And if they're not willing to take responsibility, it's really hard to have rehabilitation or, or any accountability to the community. So uh, this is something when, when I'm putting a plea through, I am listening to what they're saying. I am paying attention to what the factual basis is. Of course, it has to meet the legal definition, but you want to make sure it meets uh, the expectations of the victim, the expectations of, uh, of the community, uh, as well as yourself. Uh, because again, that factual basis is then going to be tied to your conditions, and you want to make sure uh, that that works. Obviously, when you're talking about adjudication and disposition, you do have a traditional role and you want to do it. You want to make sure, uh, because once again, you might be the only person in that courtroom who's talking about victims, who's talking about communities, who's talking about accountability, all important things in juvenile justice. Remember, in the early days of juvenile justice, without those things, the system fails. It's important that we have accountability, and that means all different things. I'm not just talking about incarceration, although that should be a tool that you have available to you. But accountability means many different things, and, uh, and there are many ways to get there. Uh, and you want to make sure a, a good juvenile justice system holds people accountable, uh, takes offenders, uh, obviously, into account as well, and makes sure their community safety is, uh, is paramount. You can't do that without having serious violent offenders, without having a system that deals uh, with serious violent offenders. This, I think, is one of the biggest reasons that transfer uh, happens because we don't have trust in our system to handle serious violent offenders. And it's important that we uh, focus on those cases. Like I said, when I'm, when I'm handling a 10-year-old chasing a 9-year-old up a tree, uh, I'm not as focused on uh, the true armed robbery, the true aggravated sexual assault, the true, um, the true uh, homicide cases that, you're gonna, that you need to handle and focus on. Uh, now, I will say, as we handle serious violent offenders, you want to make sure that the programs that you create, that they do work. Uh, because I, that, to me, is incredibly important 
uh, that we're making sure that those serious violent offenders are getting exactly what they need in terms of criminogenic need, what their risks are, because if we don't address those, your serious violent offenders are going to reoffend, and it's going to become, uh, unfortunately, uh, an issue where you have repeat offenders and recidivism. A uh, couple of things to highlight, you know, when we talk about incarceration, it needs to be something that, that you have, obviously. There are, uh, unfortunately, youth in our community that need to be incarcerated. But pay attention to the research because longer incarceration does not necessarily reduce recidivism. Uh, we want to make sure that, that what you're doing, again, ask yourself why. Is it, go, is it achievable? Is this something that we can do? Substance abuse is critical, and, and it's, it's super important that we're focusing on substance abuse uh, because that can also uh, then reduce substance abuse and offending uh, for a limited time. We want to make sure that we are uh, driven, purpose-driven in our juvenile courts uh, and, and make sure that we're actually individually assessing uh, and doing the right things uh, so that our youth come out of the system better. So I do want to talk about information sharing quickly. Uh, you want to be part of your schools. You do not want to be the vice principal. You do not want to prosecute whatever the school wants you to prosecute. You don't want your school resource officers to be vice principal. Um, but you want to have information sharing. You want to make sure that you have memorandum of understanding so that you can get school incident reports. In New Jersey, we have a, it's probably about 100 pages a memorandum of agreement. And the memorandum of agreement talks about things. It, it tells us how do you get around, not around, but how do you avoid confidentiality issues. We actually have, we call them law enforcement units. And a vice principal can be appointed to a law enforcement unit with the SRO, and those two people can in, in, interchange and exchange information without violating uh, any confidentiality rules, uh, both in New Jersey and, and legally. You obviously have discovery obligations if you get information. Uh, and you want to make sure that your schools are on board. We had a very unfortunate situation here years ago uh, where a principal uh, was not allowing us into the school to interview a witness. And uh, the, the principal said to me, uh, it's, this is my school. And I responded, well, it might be your school, but it's my county and we're coming in. Uh, and if we don't come in, we're going to have a problem. And uh, it really was that that, that highlighted for me the need to make sure that you're working uh, with all of your community partners uh, so that those issues don't uh, don't come up. If you want to do a, a, an interview uh, of a student that's not that's a witness uh, in a school environment, you want to know what the rules are. Do, do you in your jurisdiction have to notify parents? Can you do it without parents? Uh, and make sure that you're obviously addressing that. The only thing that I would highlight here is cases that come out of a school, you want to make sure, I would recommend against making it just offense specific. Because I think what's important about that is you don't want to just say that every simple assault can get diverted or that every case uh, that comes through a school that meets a, a legal definition uh, goes to, to a certain place. You, you really want to have more of a protocol, more of a uh, understanding uh, of what each offense looks like before it comes out of the school. So um, I would try not to make it just offense-based. I might make it a little more. Uh, and we are in New Jersey, it's a little bit more specific than that, uh, and that helps us. You also, in your diversion program, might have to do confidentiality and understand uh, that anything that's said during screening and assessment, that might, you might not be able to uh, get that. You know, that's critical as part of diversions, that young people can go to a diversion program, say what they did, uh, without fear of a prosecutor later on, um, becoming involved in that and using them against them in ways it was never intended to do. So um, I'm happy to share New Jersey's memorandum of understanding. It's, uh, we work on it. It's like I said, it's about 100 pages. We've, we've updated it over the years. Uh, and it, it, it defines everything that we do uh, in our schools. Uh, and, and look, I think it, this goes uh, without saying, right? So I have children myself, and they'll walk around the house saying things like, you know, that's cap, you're woke. And I have no idea what that means. And it's important that we try to, because you're going to have to interview kids. Um, obviously, when you go to trial, you know, I, I have spent, I've spent days talking to young people without ever asking them about the offense, because I want to talk to them first. I want to, I want to understand how they communicate, you know, become familiar with who they are before I put them up on the stand to tell me something very personal about themselves and something horrible that's happened to them. So you want to make sure that you're up to date and up to speed on these things. Uh, not only because of your witnesses, but I'll tell you, 
your bullying, your social media. If you don't understand how Snapchat works, how Instagram works, how things are deleted, uh, you're always going to be behind when you're trying to figure out what crimes may be committed in your community. And by the way, you get to do all of that as quickly uh, as possible. Uh, we all know that our, our courts move faster than any court I've ever worked in. Uh, and you want to make sure, and truthfully, for good reason. We want to get in there, right? We want to make sure that we're in there uh, to make sure that we're uh, imposing whatever as quickly as we can. So, Susan, I want to turn it over to you for professional wellness. I'll also be on for questions later. Thank you, Anthony. Um, I just, um, everything you said, um, obviously, I agree with when we put this together, together, but, you know, it's really, um, one of the major goals that we had in terms of having this National Center for Juvenile Prosecutors is to really elevate the profile of what juvenile prosecutors do. As Anthony said, Anthony and I both served as prosecutors in adult court first. And in many different jurisdictions, um, the role, you know, people view juvenile court as kitty court. And, and nothing could be further from the truth. When you look at where you can have the most impact on turning a life around, it's with young people. And, and that's one of the things that we're really trying to do with this current um, center that we have. And, and it's just so um, uplifting to see all the people, all the comments coming in asking to have this information be part of our listserv, because that's really truly one of the goals um, that we wanted you know, to reach and reach all of you. And and I also wanted to just mention, while there is a lot of stress, which we're going to get into that right now, um, I also think that juvenile court is probably the most fulfilling position in any prosecutor's office because you truly can turn a life around and it is a court of opportunity. And for all the um, grants out there and all the media attention to second chances, I always go back to the question of what if we got it right the first time? What if we could do things um, to really turn and, and change the trajectory of somebody? Um, we've all been teenagers. We've all been adolescents who sometimes did things that we could have really um, damaged our future on. And I just look at a lot of the cases that I hear about and think, but for the grace of God. So another important um, topic that came up when we were discussing this with some senior juvenile prosecutors is the issue of professional wellness. And especially these days between, you know, our jobs were stressful enough and now we have COVID on top of it and that's one of the reasons we couldn't do our training. Um, but one of the things that we know is stress is a fact of life for a juvenile court um, prosecutor. It comes with the territory. Um, and learning how to deal with stress is something that is truly important because you, we all need to be at the top of our game in order to be the best prosecutors that we can be. So the reality of um, what we know about addiction, now we all are very familiar with the um, opioid crisis and what's going on with the overdoses and you know, all of the horrible news with that. But the reality of addiction in the United States um, and the reality of addiction in the legal profession, um, it's not just opioids and it's not just defendants. And some of you may know who I've worked with before is that I, you know, I served as a prosecutor in the Manhattan DA's office from 1989 until 2003. Um, in July of 2001, I was the deputy bureau chief of the child abuse unit and I was also a woman who had a, a drinking problem. And um, I am happy to share with all of you that I am now a woman in long-term recovery. And for me, that means I have not had a drink since July 15, 2001. And um, I can tell you that one of the things that really fed my denial for quite some time was the fact that I was a prosecutor. How, you know, how could I be an alcoholic if I was a prosecutor? Um, and the reality is addiction is an equal opportunity um, destroyer. It doesn't care where you sit in the courtroom. It, it affects judges. It affects prosecutors. It affects defendants. It affects witnesses. So in a survey, and, and the other reality, too, is that it's not just opioids. It's, I included a slide showing that, and this is from SAMHSA last year, that alcohol is remains the most um, abused drug in the country. 
So one of the things that we're trying to do um, is to raise awareness about addiction issues within the profession. And this is kind of all started gaining momentum back in 2016, and the ABA did a survey of attorneys. And uh, they, here's the um, demographics of who they interviewed. So it was about 54, almost 53.4% males, uh, females 46.5. They did it in a way not to track data, so it was a, a truly anonymous survey. And what they found, it, this was one of the tests that they, the questions that they asked. Um, and their conclusions were that, um, and this was actually the second bullet was a headline in USA Today, that one in three scored at a level consistent, consistent with problematic drinking. And I remember reading that headline and thinking, they're lowballing it. <laughs> it's way higher than that. And it's called functional alcoholism, and it's alive and well. So one of the things I think is really important is that we recognize that um, addiction is a reality in this profession. And, um, and one of the barriers that people have is that they don't want other people to know that they may be drinking too much or trying to medicate their problems. And they think that it will destroy their careers. And so, unfortunately, that just leads to the addiction progressing and progressing. So I have been, and I wasn't always vocal about my own recovery, but it became clear to me a few years ago that once I would share it, more and more people would be like, really? And, and really, I, one of the things I wanted to show was because for years I always thought that I couldn't address it because I couldn't imagine a life without alcohol, first of all, and I couldn't imagine any other way to deal with stress. And not only have these last 19 years um, shown me that you can indeed live a life without alcohol or other types of substances, illegal substances, um, but your life can get incredibly better. And I work with a researcher from the UK, and he did a um, study where he looked at people with five plus years of recovery. And, you know, we know with other diseases or disorders, the whole goal is to get back to, well, you go to the doctor, you want to get well. Well, the amazing thing about recovery from addiction is that you actually get better than well. And you don't re return to what you were when you first came in. You actually transcend and become the person you were supposed to be. So this is, I think, especially now given all the stress um, that were under within a, you know, working in the justice system. I remember when I first went to one of my first 12 step meetings and I mentioned that I was a prosecutor and that I had worked on child abuse and sex crimes and homicides. And they said, well, no wonder you're an alcoholic. I said, I could have been in charge of the parking violations bureau and I still would have drank too much. But uh, the reality is that it's nothing to be ashamed of and they're, um, well, let me just get back to this. The reality is also that there's over 23 million people um, in America who are in recovery from addiction. So any of you, this is something that I'm doing now with DA associations across the country to let them know that it's nothing to be ashamed of, and it's actually something that can enhance um, your, your profession uh, and enhance the way you work on cases. Because I can also tell you that in all my years, as a prosecutor in Manhattan when I was drinking, I never drank in the morning, never drank during the day, but I was hung over a lot. And I'm not, I wasn't the best prosecutor I could be as a hungover prosecutor. So any of you um, feel free to reach out to me personally if you like. Um, our email addresses are included here. And as we said, there was a lot of material um, covered today. So what we will be doing is following up with you um, after the um, session, and because we don't have time to go answer all the individual questions, but um, for those of you who have asked about, we will send out the information about um, how to get in touch with us at the National District Attorneys Association and the juvenile justice work. Anthony has said he has the MOUs and other materials that he can share. I think we have two minutes left, so I, I'm probably, um, breaking the rules of NTAC, I'm sorry, am I supposed to stop now and you guys finish it up? <laughs> no, you're fine. Um, <laughs> go ahead. Oh, there goes the red light. Okay, so, um, okay, so 
I hope all of you got something from this. One of the main things we were just trying to get across is if, if the one thing you take away from today is that the role of the juvenile prosecutor is probably, I, I believe it's probably the most important position in a prosecutor's office because you have a unique ability to turn a life around. You have a unique ability to work within your community on prevention, early intervention, helping kids through the system, and then what happens afterwards, helping to identify ways to protect the community, ways to help victims, and also ways to help the offenders turn their lives around and give them the resources to live happy and peaceful and productive lives. Um, it, it's an amazing responsibility, and it truly is probably the most important role you can have in your career. So, William, I'll hand it over to you right. to close this out. All right, great. Thank you very much, Susan and Anthony. And uh, to our audience members, please note that we have recorded your questions. Uh, uh, Susan will receive those, and so thank you all for submitting those questions, and I'm pretty sure you'll um, be hearing back from, from Susan as well uh, in regards to that. But again, I do want to, again, thank our uh, presenters. Thank you, Susan, and thank you, Anthony, for such a uh, wonderful and very detailed uh, presentation today for our audience members. Uh, before we do um, uh, wrap up, and uh, wow, this is a very great quote here at the very end, but no worries. Uh, I'll leave it up here just for folks to read. Uh, and then also, please uh, be mindful of the additional resources that are located here. Please note that these are also in the uh, handout for the PowerPoint uh, as well, where you can download that and uh, get access to it. Uh, but for um, those who are uh, still on, just wanted to let everyone know that you can reach out to INTAC with the contact information here. We're on Facebook as well, where you can look us up at INTAC, N-T-T-A-C. Uh, if you'd like to get on our listserv, you can also click the link there or even uh, text us to the number there, and we can get you situated. Um, in regards to reaching out to OJJDP, you may do so through the OJJDP TTA Help Desk. The phone number and the email address where you can reach out to OJJDP is indeed on this slide. Feel free to uh, contact the GP through there, or you can also sign up for the Juve Just Listserv through OJJDP as well. Uh, again, these links are indeed live, and they are in the PowerPoint presentation as well. <coughs> um, do you have a training or technical assistance need? Well, if so, please submit it through OJJDP's TTA 360 platform. The link for the platform is live and located on this slide. Uh, again, just a reminder that this webinar is being recorded. And uh, after a, upon approval, will be posted at a later uh, time on INTAC's YouTube page. Please take a few moments to review the disclaimer here. And I'll just leave this up for two seconds. Thank you. All right, and uh, please join us for our upcoming webinars. We have a, uh, another webinar with the National Gang Center coming up on June 30th. The uh, link is live there. Uh, please note that we did have another webinar on uh, the 18th coming up. However, unfortunately, the registration is full for that, but it, uh, the video will be posted on our YouTube page. Uh, and again, we do have additional uh, webinars coming up in, uh, in July with other uh, partner organizations that we have here. And then finally, uh, Yes, yes, thank you very much for that, <laughs> Susan. Uh, we will have another uh, uh, series in this training, Module 2 and 3 coming up uh, soon as well, and we will also have that uh, promoted to folks um, who are joined today as well. So thank you very much for that, Susan. I appreciate right. that reminder. Yeah, on child, okay. um, on child and adolescent <laughs> development. Yes, yes, indeed. Thank you, thank you. And then before we wrap up, just one last thing from our audience members, uh, for those remaining, uh, we have a poll here that we'd like uh, folks to just complete, um, just to give us a little bit more information. How do you plan on applying the information that you learned uh, from this webinar in your work? Please note that this is multiple select. You can select multiple um, options here. Uh, and again, uh, this will be, um, uh, notified, or this will be placed on um, 
YouTube at a later date. And then for those who are viewing in a group, please note that uh, you can download the um, handouts in the handouts pod, the group validation that will allow for you to submit the additional people that were in the room with you. Uh, so that we can get you all your certificate. Everyone else who is signed in, please note that you will receive the uh, uh, certificate of attendance after today's uh, webinar, an automated email from Adobe Connect. Again, thank you all for joining. Uh, I'm going to put back up the main uh, area here so that folks can download any handouts that they need there. Uh, but thank you all for joining today. Everyone have a wonderful afternoon. Take care and goodbye. Thank you. The host has left the meeting. So at this time, the meeting will come to an end. Thank you, and goodbye.